Hi, Rachel. Welcome back to Taking the Scare Out of the Square. Hey, Lars. It's good to be back. I know. It's been a minute. As you can see, my backdrop has changed. Yes, it has. Now, what's on your shirt? What, what are the words on your shirt? Sure. So this is my favorite anime character. He got his own rainbow t-shirt. Um, and Fabulous. we're dealing with the creative aspect today. So, yep. you know, I think it's good to bring out the colorful, creative clothing. Absolutely. And I've got the mystical background behind me. So <laughs> see, we, we did this on purpose. I promise. There totally. you go. So we're jumping right into it. And here is Venus Square Neptune. Let's go ahead. And first of all, like we always do, just delineate really quickly why squares are so scary. You go for it. Yeah. All right. Well, first of all, for those who are new to astrology, a square aspect is when two planets are 90 degrees away from one another. And so they're they're like, think about a 90 degree angle. This is a little bit further down the, the list, but you know, a 90 degree angle represents some tension. You've got one planet going in one direction, one planet going in another direction. And, and they, when they meet, it's kind of like, it's an area of tension, but tension creates stability. And, mm -hmm. and the perfect example of this is the frame of a house. Mm -hmm. Two boards at a 90 degree angle creates the stability that makes up the structure. And it can keep an entire house afloat. You taught me an incredible hand gesture, which can kind of really allow for anyone to, to sort of feel the tension of a 90 degree angle. And so you taught me that you have a perpendicular, you just form a perpendicular like this and you relax the hand on top and you can feel that tension, which thank you so much for teaching me this since it really does elucidate um, the, the tension behind it. And part of the reason for that tension is unlike an opposition, which is the other disharmonious aspect. Mm -hmm. um, the, the square, you have two signs that don't exist on the same axis. So they don't really see each other like Gemini and Sag, which are on the same axis would, but they push needs to come to shove nonetheless. And so they need to find a way to work together. Mm -hmm. That's a really good way of, of putting it. A, a square is always the, is an aspect within ourselves that is a, it's a growth opportunity. Mm -hmm. So when you're born with a square and especially with where these outer planets are concerned, an outer planet in square, you know, an inner planet squaring an outer planet, usually what happens is these are, are, are hardwired lessons that you're learning over time and, and mastering over time. So one of the great things about squares is that they become some of your strongest character, character strengths, mm -hmm. you know, throughout your life that what might be challenging early on, and especially pre-Saturn return, so before you're 30 years old, what might be really challenging then becomes one of your greatest assets. I love that. And I think another great analogy to provide people with squares is in the pressure that they put on people in order to like create that mastery or refine over time a personality trait is carbon into a diamond. It's the only way in which you can form a diamond is through that intense pressure that's imposed upon carbon. And so it's really important for us not to lament our squares, but to lean in to them because they can really yield incredible dividends for us. Yeah, they, they're, um, you know, you see squares in the charts of very successful people who have worked their way up, self-made individuals, um, because people who have squares in their chart, um, and especially some of these more challenging ones, they learn how to work with those influences, and they're constantly in a, in a path of, of, of self-refinement, and, and like we said, growth. Absolutely. Um, should we jump into which two planets we're dealing with? Let's do. Okay, cool. So first things first, we have Venus. And Venus is known as a benefic from the traditional standpoint. It rules Taurus and Libra. And in regards to Venusian like, values, that's actually one of the big significators for me and my consultations with clients. I really zero in on how Venus relates to values, what we consider of value, very much tied to that. What else do you tie to Venus? Yeah, it's actually our material values too. So it's what, what do we want to spend our money on? What brings us pleasure? So style, 
how you express your yourself in the world. It's our, our self-worth, our attraction to beauty and, and what is beautiful to us. Definitely. You actually were someone who flagged for me that like the aesthetical component to Venus is made, your rising signs included in this as well, I remember. And it is something that I do see manifesting and I do discuss with clients as well. And then of course, people know Venus is tied to intimacy. It's not necessarily tied to like this, I would say that's more Mars, but definitely the more intimate form of like relational kind of methodology, if you will, is definitely a Venus ruled theme. Hey, hey, what are you doing? What, what, oh no. You're like, what are we doing here? <laughs> calm down, baby, calm down, relax. He's usually so good. He's just like chills and he's now he's digging a hole into the- He's into digging. The sofa. <laughs> he's like, I'm over this. Are we done working yet? No, <laughs> okay. I think like, honestly, um, you know, the, the intimate relational method methodology part of Venus is tied to the other significators that we talked about. It has a lot to do with self-worth and your value system and how you relate to someone else's value system. And your self-worth is a big part of the ability to relate to others. Yeah, it's also attraction. It's mm. what who who turns you on, um, and it's how you flirt. So whereas Ooh. Mars is more of that passion aspect of ourselves and of our sexuality, Venus is how we how we go after how we how we draw in our lovers and our and sometimes our friends. It's what we lead with, and so I think this is this can be why. People with, uh, you know, with a strong Venus can be really flirtatious. It's it's our social lives as well. For, you know, relationships, balance, harmony. These are all all aspects of ourselves that are linked to Venus. Yeah, that's a perfect encapsulation of it. So, do you want to jump to the other yeah, uh, body involved in this? And you know, Neptune, I feel like, is one of those planets, much to kind of like what it describes, where people like people kind of get lost in in figuring out Neptune right and I feel like that's part of Neptune in itself you know a big a lot of big pros with Neptune is it's very much tied to our spiritual value systems and spirituality I love the fact that there is idealism and dreams and dreaminess that comes from Neptune um, which also is tied to the compassion quality what else mm -hmm. do you have to say about Neptune one of the reasons why it relates to these things is because Neptune expands the boundaries of our aura. Mm. It, it is the planet of mysticism, which is really that sense of oneness. So the role of Neptune is to dissolve the sense that we are separate from anything in the world or, or anyone. It, it's, and this is why it relates to magic, which, you know, which is that, that animating principle that connects us all. So one of the things that happens when we're talking about Neptune is that because Neptune's dissolving our, our boundaries and dissolving our sense of separateness, it relates to our intuition. We can pick up on energy and become really, it's the, it shows us how sensitive we are to thoughts and feelings and vibes that are happening out in the world. But this can lead to a sense of confusion mm -hmm. because what's mine versus what's others versus what's happening in the world. If there's no sense of separateness, then, then it can be difficult to, to, you know, our egos can struggle a little bit. Definitely. And what comes to mind as you're describing this and like how Neptune can kind of materialize or kind of activate is I drove through heavy fog recently mm -hmm. and the sensation of driving through heavy fog is kind of like shadow Neptune or what people need to learn to overcome with Neptune. There is this, like the boundaries disappear. Like I didn't know where yeah. the guardrails were. I didn't know what was really in front of me, right? Like it's true, like all of that dissolves as a result of, of this force and literally Neptune rules fog too. So I find that yeah. very interesting. In addition to that, Neptune rules creativity, which is beautiful. Anything that takes us beyond this world, it definitely rules music. What else would you feel like would be tied to that creativity? Well, I think any of the arts, dancing, any kind of, um, you know, whereas the sun is more of our creative expression, mm -hmm. uh, Neptune is the creative flow of, of energy. At the same time, often when you have a, a really prominent Neptune or a really, you know, really strong Neptune influence in your chart, 
you need something to something to help you translate everything that's going on in the in the spiritual realm within yourself. Mm-hmm. And so that's one of the reasons why Neptune can be associated with escapism, mm-hmm. with disassociation. You know, it's really a, a planet that relates to our right brain, the right hemisphere of our brain. Yeah, totally. And with disassociation, like there's disassociative coping mechanisms that are definitely, you know, a big pattern with a strong Neptune in general, I would say arguably, especially with this aspect as one of like the three squares, I would think to Neptune and something that the native would need to learn to, to ground themselves in, in sort of like the physical, because Neptune really, it dissolves everything, like you said. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's important to note, like why, why Neptune relates to to this, to this is, you know, if we're talking about the, the the our sense of separateness comes from the ego. That's the ego's job. Mm-hmm. Me, myself, my, you know, and I. <laughs> and if Neptune's dissolving that, you know, our ego gives us structure, a structure, uh, a set of beliefs, ideas. It's it's a framework within which we operate in the world. And so if We've, if we've, we're working with a, a, a challenging Neptune aspect or a challenging Neptune transit, and that sense of separateness goes away, and that sense of who I am goes away, then then being in the world can feel really uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, because we're not in the 5D world yet, where where <laughs> where you can be boundaryless and, and mystical and, and, and experience oneness all the time, and it's just a normal state of being. So it's not a it's not a bad thing if you know how to work with it. And one of the ways to work with it is through a dedicated spiritual practice and through creative outlets. I love that you speak to that because, you know, in just talking about how this square would materialize, it's really important why how we're taking the scare out of the square, not only is in showing the bright side or a lot of the potential and potency in the square, but also in providing coping mechanisms to people as they're learning to refine over time and putting in those 10,000 hours with the square. Arguably, I think m- my favorite aspect of Venus Square Neptune as someone who doesn't have it, but has a couple of friends with it, (laughs) is the fact that they are super compassionate and ultra forgiving. And there is just like that, the the lack of boundaries tied very much to the relational Venus, I feel like definitely does manifest itself that way. Yes, and uh, this is also a signature in the charts of people who are very creative and who have uh, a real need to express themselves creatively. But it's really important because because there can, and, and, and a lot of this depends on other factors in the chart as well, but it's really important to ground that creative energy uh, in a, a tangible form. So write a screenplay, take a dance class. Otherwise it, it can, there can be like a sort of like a confusion or wanting to do too much or becoming, becoming disappointed with yourself for not doing more. So grounding that creativity is actually a, a way to mediate this aspect in your, in your chart. I love that. And I think, you know, you speak to the disappointment that may come with Venus square Neptune. And that partly has to do with the rose colored glasses component, especially from the relational perspective. But the idealism that Neptune does brood in someone, the ability to just achieve, you know, whatever comes to mind and in a beautiful way may not like materialize, you know, in the present, which can lead to that disappointment. And going back to those rose colored glasses, I think that that's like a hashtag for Mm -hmm. Venus Square Neptune is in kind of everything that they do. And it is really important that in order to remediate the rose colored glasses for the native to adopt some sort of framework of a value system that they can use to kind of to gauge people since it's really, it's really tough for natives to, to do that. And I think about like an Ariana Grande lyric, which is that she fell in love with the potential without checking credentials. I uh, love it. That's, that is like the epitome of Venus for <laughs> Neptune right there. Falling in love with the potential, with the idea of who someone is or the idea of love and the dream of love. Right, totally. And it could be the fact that like, you're this creative person who's really into like, 
an obscure type of music and the person that you're falling in love with because they love that obscure music. You don't look at anything else regarding like that person because of the, just that, that sharedness, that oneness that you have with them. And so it is important to a, have that framework that you operate in and then only process with people you trust. Don't give up your heart to someone that you don't trust yet. I always tell my clients with this aspect, make a list of non-negotiables. If you're single, make a list of non-negotiables. What won't you tolerate in a relationship? Mm -hmm. You know, put drug addiction on there or, or don't, you know, like it, every, for everyone is different. But, you know, one of the things that can happen with this aspect is that you can draw into your life really creative people mm -hmm. and then you're the stable one or vice versa. But if, if you, you know, if you take this or you could draw in someone who maybe struggles with disassociative, disassociative coping mechanisms, mm -hmm. like someone who struggles with drug or drugs or addiction, or maybe you come from a family background where this is a, where this is a, a, a concern of yours, make a list of non-negotiables like that framework that you're talking about and say, this is what I won't tolerate. And, and then like really hold that, you know, if you, if you have this aspect know that you are going to be inclined to second guess yourself mm -hmm. to, to, to say, oh, well, this is a problem, but I'm sure it's going to be okay. That rose colored glasses with any Neptune influence in our, in our charts, challenging Neptune influence, we're always being asked to trust our gut feelings. Don't try to rationalize. If you find yourself rationalizing, then turn off your brain and go into your heart or into your gut. I love that very much intuition, right? Yeah, your intuition is so strong, but it's it's often telling you something you don't want to know. And so <laughs> this is this is the resistance to bursting the bubble. Neptune is the dream, it's the ideal. And and anything that's going to burst that bubble is going to take us into Saturn's domain, which is like real life. Um and 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 I think it's important to note that this is the case with friendships, this is the case with personal finances, because Venus rules, rules relationships of all kinds, primarily our romantic relationships, and it also rules finances. So, so it's important to pay attention to the, re the, the real picture and not be afraid of bursting the bubble. Definitely. And I think, you know, another thing as a remediation tactic, in addition to what you're describing, I love that non-negotiables list, by the way, and I'm going to take that <laughs> for my clients. Um, yeah. I think that's so important. This is an aspect in any Venus Neptune aspect is very much tied to like living wholeheartedly. I think to Brene Brown's book, 10 Guideposts to Wholehearted Living. Yeah. So if you are watching this because you're struggling with your Venus square Neptune, that is definitely a good start if you've never read it as well. I think that, that that's a good book that can set guideposts. Some kind of guideposts can serve as like stakes in the ground for someone who has their whole heart to give in a way to channel it. Yeah. It's really such a gift for anyone you're in relationship with. Your friends or I mean, it really is beautiful, beautiful love, but we need to to, to know how to, to focus that and, and how to make sure that it's not, you're not loving and it's, you know, giving to an empty bucket or right. loving with a diminished return. That's a big thing. It's like, it's so great for everyone around the native. And it's important. Like if you have that capacity to give so much love to everyone else, you have that capacity to give your love to yourself too. Amen. Same, yeah. So I think that's the big takeaway for Venus Square Neptune. Yeah. I love that. That's a good note to end on, actually. That's I it. agree. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. We have plenty more squares to do. So definitely, you know, stay tuned for the next one. Yeah.